Did you ever think you would make it? I feel I'm so close I could take sweet victory. I know this life meant for me. Yeah, why would you bet on Goliath when we got bet David? Value taming, giving values contagious. This world of entrepreneurs, we get no value to haters. How they run, homie, look what I become. I'm the, I'm the one. I was eating it's fake. Just- California. Yeah, it was not the kind of food. Anyway, so today we got a special podcast. It's episode number what? 249. We have Frank Rodriguez, whom I'll play a clip for you that if you don't recognize, he is the executive director from Gays Against Groomers. I saw a video clip of what he said, which I'll play again in a second. Uh, and I said, I, I, it's impressive to have uh, a message like that being given to the audience that he did. And then I looked him up, I shared it on Twitter, and then him and I got connected. I want to say, Frank, you and I have been talking for a month, two months. We've been going back and forth, and then eventually I talked to Rob. I said, let's get you on the calendar. You're here now. You flew in from a wonderful airport that we all love. So for those of you that don't know Gays Against Groomers, let me kind of set you up in a beautiful way. Please. Because I know Wikipedia, obviously, whatever they write, it's got to be 100% accurate. (laughs) Of course. So let's kind of go through this. So here's Wikipedia's definition of Gays Against Groomers. is an American far-right, anti-LGBT organization known for protesting against gender-affirming care for minors, including including, uh, at uh, hospitals that provide it, against LGBT representation at schools, and against Drag Queen Story Hour events. Some people may say these are good things. Uh, if you call that far right, you take that far right out, many parents would say these are things I'm concerned about. A spokesperson for the LGBT advocacy group, GLAD, has claimed that the group uses the slur groomer to characterize LGBT people as pedophiles. GAG has hosted anti-LGBTQ rallies alongside other far right and anti LGBTQ organizations such as Moms for Liberty, which has been attended by Proud Boys. And then it goes into explaining how Jamie Mitchell started it, who before what she did and how it led to lives of TikTok and those videos went viral, et cetera, et cetera. Having said that, thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. From your perspective, what does Gays Against Groomers do? Yeah, so we're a coalition of gay people that do not stand for the sexualization, medicalization, or indoctrination of children through the LGBT umbrella. And for instance, Wikipedia likes to, you know, preference that using the word groomer is an anti-LGBTQ slur. And I would argue, regardless of what your sexuality is, anyone can be a groomer. And so we're targeting all of the things that are happening within our community that damages children. And that's going to be um, like Drag Queen Story Hour, which is hypersexualized content in front of children. Um, we're also pushing back against gender ideology, which is forces children to go down a journey of chemical castration or seeking out surgeries um, to do these types of things to affirm these genders that they feel like. Um, our organization spends a heavy amount of, a heavy excuse me, a heavy amount of time educating the public with information sessions, attending school board meetings, city council meetings. We have our voices heard in federal legislatures and state legislation, and to be able to combat a lot of these things. Our organization is filled with so many people that have the same vision for our community, wanting to be accountable for the things that our community is doing and fixing it which is why all of us identify or fall under the LGBT umbrella. So being anti ourselves is never something that uh, is in our mission. Our mission is to save children from the indoctrination that's happening through our umbrella. That's pretty well. I brought, obviously we have Jed here from the great Jedediah Bila Live show, and we got the <laughs> biz doc in the house as well. Uh, both of you are parents. You have uh, uh, Hartley. You got Bailey and Brooke. I got uh, my set of kids as well. This is something that's very important to all of us as parents. It is a concern. I do want to play this clip of what got my attention of what you were talking about. And some of you who follow the podcast closely, you saw this clip a couple months back. If you want to play this, maybe the first two minutes will be great. Every teacher that has a pride flag in their classroom should be fired and arrested. The gay flag is a sexual flag. It represents nothing other than sexual things. Gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and questioning. What business is it of anyone on this board of what children would like to do with other children? It is none of your business. It is between them and their parents. But however, you guys want to illegally survey your students, 
My name is Frank Rodriguez. I'm the Executive Director of Operations for Gays Against Groomers. I'm a 31-year-old gay man pushing back against the agenda that's happening within our classrooms. Keeping parents away from this discussion is absolutely severing the relationship between a, a child and their parent. My community is not discriminated against anymore. Shockingly enough, we succeeded. Now you're sending out surveys that's asking students what their gender is, what their pronouns are, and whether or not you should be telling their parents. Could you imagine if my son or one of yours went to school and said, hey, I'm gay and you never knew? All of you up here are pretty intelligent. You have doctorate degrees, you're educated, and you lead this district. But yet, you turn a blind eye with the sexual things that happen in your classroom. I refuse to believe that any of you think that that's appropriate. Because if you think that that is appropriate, you would be a predator. There's images that are going to be displayed today for you to see of a child sucking another child off. And that's in your classrooms. I shake because it makes me uncomfortable to even utter those words to you. This is nothing about inclusion. It is nothing about respect to my community. I say with you with 100% truth, according to the Center of Disease Control, that the reason my community faces such issues in this world has absolutely nothing to do with the straight people on this planet. Has everything to do with the drugs that we digest. Has everything to do with our access to health care. The number one reason my community has so many mental health issues is because they don't have access to health care. And that's, the, that's directly from the CDC. It is not slurs. It's not gay bashing. It, we don't have access to therapy. If you really want to help the LGBTQ community to feel really accepted in this world, embrace that people have mental health issues and they should seek help. Having a classroom without the American flag in it is a disgrace to this country. Uh -huh. If this country wasn't here, millions of people around the world would perish. And that flag, this flag, should be held high by every single student. So, question. When you gave that speech, I saw it. I couldn't believe it. Um, you can always judge, you know, who is an enemy based on who reacts to this and who pushes back and saying, I can't believe he said this. What a speech. This is ridiculous. He's such a this. He's such a that. Who pushed back on your speech? Who came back and said, Crank, you don't know what you're talking about? So the main people that pushed back against this was going to be my community, the LGBT community. They're very vocal in this, the, the far left, um, when it comes to these types of things, the, the woke um, side of this. And then also a lot of um, woke uh, women also uh, pushed back on this. I think um, when it comes to my community, you know, the, the gay community, when we point out these things that really need help, such as our mental health issues or our drug addiction rates, no one wants to talk about these things. They want to brush those under the rug. But the moment you get someone like Huntington Beach wanting to just fly the American flag at their facilities, they get uproared, they get angry, they get mad. But no one fights for the things that we actually need. And so that's why I'm really glad that this speech that I say that shook the world actually opened the eyes to a lot of people because there are things that my community needs. Um, and unfortunately, they're pushing back on it. Jed, your reaction when you're hearing something like this as a parent, what are your thoughts about this? Yeah, as a parent and somebody who used to work in schools, um, you know, this is, a to me, a deeply anti-parental rights movement. And the school really wants to get in the way of the relationship between parents and their children. And you have guidance counselors now, I'm sure you know, that are being told by administration, keep it confidential, don't make phone calls home to parents. You need to make sure these kids are protected. And they present it as a guide of protection, essentially, against their own parents. So you have kids being turned against their parents in many respects, and they feel like the parents are the enemy. They no longer speak to their parents. It breaks down the lines of communication, which essentially enables you know, indoctrination on many levels then. Then you have students in oftentimes left-wing institutions. <clears throat> they're not communicating with their parents. And larger issues begin to you know, be received in terms of the indoctrination that we see in schools. I think it's interesting, though, when I heard you talk about the American flag. That had to be such an enormous trigger for these people because a lot of the people who are battling against what, what you're doing are, are also battling what this country represents, mm -hmm. you know, everything this country represents. And I think them hearing you say that about the American flag, the response, the trigger re reaction is, 
well, there's people who don't like the American flag. So, you know, what is your point about those people that, you know, should, why can't we take the American flag down? Why is the American flag held to a different standard than an LGBTQ flag? So I'm sure that they felt incredibly triggered by that remark, because not only do they have a deep resentment of this country and a deep resentment of everything it stands for, but they want to correlate what you're, uh, uh, what you're saying is true, a sexual a representation of sexuality and a representation of just this country, the values of liberty, the values of freedom and whatnot. So I think that's I think that's where you drove these people to insanity. Just the reference of the American flag itself will make them nuts. So and thanks for doing what you're doing, because, you know, if nothing else, you're speaking out. And it's, it's, I'm sure you get I can't even imagine what comes your way from the woke community. So good for you, man. Thank you. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this article. What is sexual grooming? This is an article from 2017. I don't know if you have this or not. It's not a newer article. Uh, it's uh, uh, six years old. Seven things to know about this abuse tactic, okay? Number one, anyone can be a victim, okay? It often starts with friendship. Got it. Perpetrators use favors and promises to build trust. Makes sense. Five, grooming can be difficult to distinguish. I'm sorry, secrecy is a common characteristic of grooming which is number four. Number five is grooming can be difficult to distinguish from romance. Victims can get out. Family members and friends can help, but it's important for them to tread uh, carefully. So this, this comment, this topic of grooming, I watched Vice do the documentary they did two weeks ago. I don't know if you saw that or not, from a couple weeks ago when it came out. Did you see the... the I don't think so. Okay, no. it's not really a documentary. It's just a clip they put on their channel. If you can go to it, I just send it to you on your... Uh, uh, yeah, right there. So this whole thing that came out, uh, transphobic influencers are driving a violent groomer conspiracy. Okay, so we don't need to play this clip, but if you play it, you guys are in it. You know, uh, Matt Walsh is in it. Rogan's in it. A lot of people are in it that they're pushing back. I'm sure you saw this, Jed, I did on what they're doing. Okay, so the, the argument of this video is there is no such thing as groomers. Okay, cool. No problem. Now, play what just came out from Project Veritas. That one you can actually play yeah. from two days ago, which I'm sure you guys have seen if you've that, not yeah. seen it. This is from two days ago, okay? And this is what parents are concerned about, right? When this uh, uh, reverend, I think it's called the reverend of, uh, what is the organization called? I think it's called... Uh, um, it's out in California. Landslide California. something, something, you know, Rob, I texted it to you. If you want to look at it, uh, uh, it's an Instagram video. It says, uh, breaking groomers, Reverend Casey Martinez, you know, how they do what they do. If you just look at your text, you'll see that I send it it's to you. It's Loomis Basin Congregation of the United Church of Christ, Casey martinez Uh That's the guy who was. Very disturbing to see what this guy is saying in the interview. Do you see it? I'll just put a thumbs up so you see it. Um, uh uh, I think I texted to you like literally 839. If you look up 839, I send it to you right there. Put a thumbs up on it. And you see, have you, have you taken a look at this interview yet, Tom, or no? No. I want you to listen to this. If you can zoom in a little bit so the audience can see it, there you go. And refresh it so we can watch it from the beginning. Perfect. Uh, there we go. Audio. In my mind, how communities I thrive can ride, is read the first part. So I am Try to refresh and get the audio at the same time and pause it so I can just read the, just press the button so it doesn't play. I know we're like this close to having parents freaking the F out is how he opens it up. Then play it. Like this close to having parents freaking the in my mind, how communities thrive is through intergenerational relations. So I and the older queer folks are mentoring these young adults. Have you talked to your kids about the order? How do you, have you considered blockers? How, how critical is it, do you think, critical. to get them when they're young? Critical. We used to meet at the church because it was free and kids would say they're going to youth group. We moved to the library because kids said they were meeting their friends at the library. Wow. So it's not lying, but it's not fully the truth. When they know that their queer kid is coming to me for support, they're gonna be upset. It's when you are purposely misgendering them, when you are purposely not using their name. How do you handle that? I call CPS. But that's your standard protocol. 
If we want these kids to thrive and survive, we must get to their parents first. Meet Reverend Casey Tinnen of Loomis Basin Congregational Church in Loomis, California. Casey is also the founder of The Landing Spot, a nonprofit community center meant to create, quote, a safe, supportive, and empowering space for LGBTQIA plus youth and their families. Pause it. A project. It's, it's stuff like this that uh, parents see and, and vice one minute is saying, no one's doing this. The word conspiracy, yeah. it's a conspiracy theorist, groomers, all this other stuff. Then you see this and they say, okay, Vice, why don't you now do something like Project Veritas is doing and really find out for us from both sides whether this is happening or not. What's your reaction when you see something like this? Uh, groomings happen in many forms. It's not just sexual grooming. When you think of grooming, you're, anytime you take a child away from a parent and teach them something that it goes against the parent's beliefs, you are grooming that child into your ideologies, your beliefs, in the way that you want that child to be, regardless if that's going to be sexual, religious, or any other political ways that you think that that child should be. Grooming is happening in so many different capacities, and that's why Gays Against Groomers is making such headway in this, because we're breaking barriers and destroying destroying narratives that the woke agenda has formed to be able to captive to captive these children against their parents like we were saying earlier if a child if like in this video where they say that you know children might you know commit suicidality or something like that having parents involved in that child's experience from day one from when they're born until the parents are gone is vital to the success of that person and that's vital for for my community if we don't have our parents involved in the decisions that we're making, you're setting up that child to have 40% higher drug addiction rates, 25% to be able to commit suicide, and just going down a journey that is not supported on their own. They need their parents. And so like this video saying he can't go to the parents, that's deeply disturbing because if a child has questions about who they are or the journey they want to take in their life, the number one people that can handle this conversation are the parents. I mean, they can't indoctrinate the kids, though, unless they remove the parents. Oh, it's integral. Yeah. So, I mean, what th that guy saying, sitting and saying, a reverence, no less, sitting and encur not, he, outright encouraging lying, saying, you know, lie to your parents. He says, well, it's not lying, but of course it's lying. And saying that he's going to call Child Protective Services yes. on parents for misgendering the kids. I mean, he's now making a decision. He's deciding to play parent. He's removed those parents from the equation. He said, you don't matter. You're a hazard to your own children. He's made that decision. And now he said, well, I'm going to do a better job. The state essentially is going to do a better job of raising your kids than you are. And it's such an integral step because if you had parents involved, you would have pushback. So what's interesting is that for years, we've had indoctrination of kids, years and years and years. And that you're right, that has been grooming. And you know, a lot of conservatives have pushed back on that for years. But something different happened here when it applied to this stuff related to sexuality, that word groomer, because that word was used before. We've been using, I've been using that word, oh, they're grooming kids in schools for years. But there wasn't this type of pushback. Why do you think now, when it came to sexuality, why why such a pushback to the point where you've gotten banned? I'm sure we'll talk about that, where that word was banned on Twitter, where you couldn't talk about something. There is something deeply sinister going on with this agenda as it relates to children. And I don't know if there's a lot of money to be made by pharma. I don't know if a lot of institutions are connected, but there's something different going on that goes above and beyond just traditional indoctrination in schools, that they are responding to you the way that they are. What do you think that is? Yeah, so I talk about this a lot um, in my community. You kind of see it from this gentleman here who obviously is gay. Um, the gener or the time that we grew up, there was definitely a time where we were suppressed. We were, you know, attacked for just simply being who we were. And I'm a firm believer that a majority of my community has not overcome that closet trauma. And now they're projecting that onto these kids and they're suffering the consequences of this. And so you see that in the statistics like, you know, 60 percent of my community not getting access to mental health care. And so pairing that with what we're seeing today, a lot of the people like this gentleman here, I hate to say, is probably dealing with some sort of mental health issue that he has not overcome. And now we're projecting this on this onto kids as if it's going to help them. And it's not. We're seeing damage. We're seeing kids, you know, uh, seeking out gender affirming surgeries and coming back and saying that they don't want to transition because of behaviors like this affirming. I, I, got, I got two questions for you. Okay. For, I'll go with this one since we are on the topic right now. Uh, Frank, at what age did you know you were gay? 
Yeah, so um, I started thinking about, you know, my sexuality probably around 10 years old and um, started talking to my parents about it and going um, down that journey with them. The most concerning part is if I would have grown up in today's society, um, simply putting on my mom's shoes and maybe playing around with her makeup would have deemed me a girl and they would have sent me to be medically transitioned and I would no longer be able to have kids right now. So that's why you see our community pushing back on this because I would have fell victim to this agenda. In that video, you said you're a 31-year-old gay man. Are, are you 31 or 32? 31. 31. Okay, so you're still 31. That's great. Yeah. Still, when's your birthday? You're... January. Oh, so we got some time to go. We so you're going to celebrate time. 31 for a minute. <laughs> so here's a question for you. I, I asked it before you came in, and I was wondering what these guys would say. Out of 100 gay men, specifically gay, you know, how many of the gay men in America you think were born gay? How many you think were recruited, baptized, indoctrinated innated into believing they're gay, or they just had a really rough life, father figure wasn't there, it was a mess, parents, drugs, whatever. What percentage do you think they were born? What percentage were like, I may be, I'm not getting the attention, let me maybe be gay. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I remember reading a study that said, like, the more older brothers you have, the more likelihood you are to be, you know, homosexual. Um, if I had to take a best guess, I don't have statistics on this. I would say probably 25% of the gay community was, you know, sexually assaulted that put them into this um, community. I've seen, um, you know, plenty of that happen. And um, probably, you know, the rest is, is, is the grooming. But a majority of people I would feel like myself just come to the, the being of, you know, I just am attracted to the sex that I'm attracted to. Um, so I would say about 25% of as a best guess. 20, 25% was born. No, 25% would have been groomed or, you know, had some sort of negative life influence that would have and led the, them down that. And journey. you think the other 75% is, was born that way? Yeah, like when we say born that yeah. way, I would I would argue that it would be growing up in a, in a generation or in a, in a journey that um, you didn't have like, grooming happening where it's like you must be gay like it's happening now you know throwing it like i believe you mentioned in a podcast saying it to a child a thousand times it's gonna you know right you know i was saying it to adam yeah 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 and so i'm thinking you know 75 percent are just simply have great parents and were just embraced of who they were and grew up to be a gay person can, can you can you did you see the bill maher episode where he talked about what percentage of different generations were gay did you ever see that clip or no I think it's doubled. I think it went from like one percent. I got to show this to you. Yeah. So, so here's here's what he does, and he says if you if you look at the silence generation, 0.8 percent of the silent generation born in the 40s is gay, 2.6 percent of uh, boomers, 4.2 percent of Gen X, 10 and a half percent of millennial, 20.8 percent of Gen uh, uh, what is that? Is that Gen uh, Z? And then 41.6. I don't know if 41.6 is. Gen, uh, Gen Y or Gen Z. Okay, but, but you're seeing the trend going up. Obviously, the joke for him was by 2080, we're all going to be gay. Okay, that's <laughs> kind of what Bill Maher was talking about. But when you, when you think about a percentage growth like this, all I think about is, is, is it really 75%? We, we don't know. I mean, no matter that's not a research that anybody's going to really be able to get, right? Because if there's, we all have a friend like, hey, when I was a kid, I remember this one guy, there were two brothers, and we knew from fourth grade they were this, you know? Hey, I remember when I was a kid, you know, this person was, I remember this girl that was, we all have a story where we look at it and say, yeah, that makes sense. I'm not surprised. And we grew up, we're like 22 years old. Did you know Johnny was, well, am I surprised? I knew at eight years old this guy was possibly going to be this. I think the concern that a lot of parents are having Bill Moore is not a parent. This guy chose to live a different life. He's also sitting there saying, why are the percentages of gays keep increasing the way it does? So, so then the grooming concept gets a little bit of credibility. Maybe that is mm -hmm. happening. Maybe, maybe it is becoming a religion to be part of the LGBTQ community. Because if that's the case and if it's a religion, what is wrong with baptizing others? What is wrong with trying to convince you, you know, whether you're gay or not, whether you like men or not? So that's the argument where, you know, if if other religions are baptizing people, can I imp impose my religion on you? Can I impose my philosophy on you? So do you think they see it that way, the groomers see it that way, that I'm baptizing your kids just like the institution has been baptizing us into believing we're Christians, God exists, all this other stuff? Do you think they see it that way? I think— um 
when someone is grooming a child, you know, to be a part of the LGBT community, I think they know exactly what they're doing. You see a lot of uh, people, especially on TikTok, you know, pushing this onto their children as if it's something, some sort of fad. We use this this phrase called trans trending, and it's because we see, like in schools, like in, in Castro Valley Unified School District, they painted 10-foot uh, pride flags on their floors in their elementary schools. If you're not putting gay on a pedestal and popularizing it, um, you know, then I don't know what is. So they're putting the, these this community as a on a pedestal, and everyone wants to strive for that in school. And the students are messaging us saying that they can't speak out, they can't, you know, tell people how they feel because they're in fear of judgment, they're in fear of violence, and this is happening as young. I get these messages from kids in elementary school that they're scared. And so I would agree, I would agree that based on these numbers, you can definitely say, um, you know, grooming is happening at a wide scale in our school systems. And one of the things that my side or the woke side will, will push back on is people are more accepting now. People are able to be themselves now and come out of the closet now. And I would argue there is absolutely no statistics to prove that. But there are statistics showing that the more acceptance and the more we push it in our schools, the more children are going to identify that way. And if we want to play dumb, then we cannot acknowledge that. Would you, would you, uh, uh, Tom and, uh, and uh, uh, Jed, I'm going to ask you guys as parents, would you, would it bother you if they came out and they got a tax code like Scientology and it becomes a religion mm -hmm. and it's no longer um, a gender you know, where it's not a gender, that you're, you're male, female, oh, my God, all these other pronouns that I got to remember. all. The no, guess what it is? Moving forward, LGBTQ is a religion. We're a nonprofit organization. We have preachers. We have pastors. And we baptize. And, yes, we are converting. We are doing it the same way Christians are doing it, the same way Muslims are doing it, the same way Catholics are doing it, the same way seven-day you know, Jehovah LDS is doing it. That's what we're doing. We are officially religion. Would that make you a little bit more comfortable knowing their motive is now clear? Well, it would be transparent, at least. Yeah. I mean, it's a religion already. We can all acknowledge it is a religion. Correct. I mean, I always say leftism is a religion, environmentalism. They, these radical agenda, they, these are religions. But they they would, one, never do that because part of what's happening here is, you know, indoctrination, there, there's a slyness to it. There's a sneakiness to it. There's a, you have to normalize the grooming, right, in order to indoctrinate. You have to make it like, no, this is just a new way of life. Where this is, we're just being accepting and kind. Before we were bigoted and we were harassed people and now we're just making everything this is what the new normal is and it's healthy they need it to look like that if it becomes a religion then they're going to open themselves to a lot of criticism there's going to be people that are going to be able to say i opt not to be a part of that and just like someone else can say i opt not to be a part of christianity or i opt not to be a part of judaism that would have to also be accepted then that you make a choice and you're either going to be part of this whole grooming system or you're not they don't want that they want that to be the new normal whereby then everyone has to adhere uh, or wear the, label, wear the label of being a bigot. That's the structure that needs to be in place for the grooming to be successful. Yeah, you know, I, I look at it and th their goal is, is not to be separate and contrasted. They don't want that because if you say, oh, you're a religion, now you're a category. Now you're in a box. You draw a box around that, and that's not what the movement wants because that's going to create contrast. That's going to create separatism. Oh, Jewish people are like this. Muslim people are like this, and this group over here is like this. That's not what they want. Exactly what she said. They want normalcy. More importantly, this is just noise. What's going on deeper underneath is a socialist Marxist trend to split children away from their parents, not on any – particular sexual theme, but for the state to control thought and the state to kind of indoctrinate kids. And that's really what the big root of the tree is. And all we're seeing on this is, is kind of noise. But if they were to just, you know, it is religion and she's correct. It's an idea allowed. I do you understand what I'm, I, I want you to think about the question I'm asking. Yeah. Just hear me out the question I'm asking. What if they flat out came and they said they are a religion? Okay. Mm -hmm. And you know, here's what we believe in. We want to baptize you in the name of the lesbians, the gays, the, you know, whatever, the LGBT, you know, this is what we do. And we think this is a way of life. You know, it, it, then you and I can sit there because somebody, somebody can argue and say, what's wrong with what we're doing? You guys are doing that. Okay. When your kids go to Christian schools, don't you ask them to read the Bible and do that? Is, isn't that a form of shaping their mindset? 
Isn't that what you're doing? Yeah, again, their okay. argument. I'm just thinking about but what their argument the would be. The club would be very small, though, because Correct. most people don't want this. What happens is the kids go to these schools. They're groomed. They're indoctrinated. Now those kids are being changed and transformed without even realizing it. So they need people to be in a system where they don't realize what's happening to them, and it's stealthy, and it's sly, and then all of a sudden they're part of the club, and everyone has to accept it. If it was something that you, that you had to join, and actually actively understand what it was. How many parents do you think would really want their kids to be part of that religion? There would be almost no one. Parents are being dragged into this because they don't have a choice because kids go to school. All of this happens without parental consent and before they know it, they're being puppeteered. So without the puppeteering, the whole system breaks down and that club would actually be it would consist of, you know, a, a lot of crazy people and some hard leftists, and it would be very small and it would be isolated. They can't have it be isolated. It needs to be media endorsed. It needs to be Hollywood endorsed. It needs to take over society at large or they're not happy. Yeah, to answer your question directly, it would at least be intellectually straightforward and transparent. And they would say, OK, this is us. This is our box. This is right. where we are. Yeah. But what they would find, what you will find in there is you would find and maybe this is a question back for you. You would find a huge percent of people that identify as as gay or lesbian of being equally concerned, you know, about their about the the reflection back on them. So the more separate that the, the, as you would say, the religion or the cult of grooming becomes, the more isolated it becomes, even from the mainstream, you know, gay and lesbian f families and citizens. I, I would say like the biggest distinction when you want to like compare it to like a religion, um, you know, for the aspect of grooming, you're removing those parents from to groom that child. So in this case, you would be removing the parents to groom them in, in under this new religion. And so that is a big, big red flag for me. And I think that that's absolutely disgusting because when you take someone, when you take a child like your child to a church, any church of any denomination, you are grooming that child because that is your child. You make that decision as the parent. That is your child. But when my community removes you as a parent and wants to indoctrinate that child into this religion, now you're a predator. Frank, uh, uh, go, go to any one of your guys. So in, in the last seven, eight years, the seven years, the number one uh, pastor, preacher that baptized the most people into the religion of Christianity, 210 million people is Billy Graham. Okay. In the last 15 years, one would say it's Joel Osteen. He does it at the old Rockets, you know, Houston Rockets Arena and 80,000 people come per weekend, and he is the current modern day. Who is the Billy Graham or the Joel Osteen of the LGBTQ community baptizing the most people right now? I would say RuPaul. You think RuPaul? Yes. His show that he puts on is hyper-sexualized. It's put on mainstream TV, and they even spoke about grooming in their most recent uh, season. Children see this on TV, and granted, the things that happen on TV are not going to be as sexual as what you see in person, but that is the gateway to want to explore this industry. Now, when a child goes to a place like RuPaul's DragCon that attracts thousands of people, you see children on stage performing for adults in ways that are very inappropriate. And the only place that that behavior is okay is in platforms and places like what the LGBT community puts up. And if you take a child to a straight bar and allow them to do these things, it's all of a sudden, that's wrong. But because you paint pride flags on the walls and celebrate sexuality, it's now all of a sudden okay. Who, who else would you put on that list outside of RuPaul? Um, w would you put this Jeremy Marsh guy up there on TikTok, what he's doing? You know who I'm talking about? Yes, Je Jeffrey Marsh. Jeffrey he's Marsh. a big can you, player, yeah. Can you play this one here real quick? I mean, this sounds very appropriate, the way he talks. Just listen to this, obviously, sarcastic. Hey kids. Hi, kids. I want to talk to the kids. Hey, kids. <laughs> Hi, kids. Hey, kids. Hi. It's good for children to see LGBTQ lives. Your parents screwed up. If you need a family, you can come hang out with me. Very appropriate. I mean, just sounds like a sweetheart of a guy, right? Very creepy. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Well, but, the but, whole tone, right? But the, but the question I'm asking is, you know, this is purely baptism this is nothing more than baptism this is nothing more than you know what some of these cults would recruit people over who are some of the bigger cult leaders that we read about that you know have done documentaries or movies about right there's a bunch of them the model works you know 
you pin them against parents, you, you know, create an enemy, it's not fair, you make them feel welcome, you make them feel loved, they go to a place, they're accepted, they're a little bit weird, and hey, come and be part of our group. It is a form of baptism. This is why I think it's, a, it's becoming a religion. This is not a gender argument. This is purely a religion, and they feel their approach right now. They're ba- obviously, if you look at statistically, you got to give them credit. They're winning because statistically, they're baptizing a higher percentage of generation to generation to generation, and they're winning. So you guys want to fight against that, right? What is your approach to fight against that? Yeah, so um, a lot of people don't hear from, you know, our side of the gay community. And there are a lot of people on our side that do not agree with this. The moment you, such as like this gender ideology, the moment you say a man is however you want to identify or a woman is however you want to identify, you just eliminated gays and lesbians. That's my whole sexuality. Mm. I'm attracted to men, not someone that identifies as a man and not someone with a prostate. I'm attracted to men. And the moment you change that now, you're now I'm no longer here. So that's why a majority of our community, especially on our website that we mentioned, an overwhelming amount of the LGBT community is not okay with what is happening now with this gender ideology. So what we do is we go to school boards and we t- we let them know like ways that they can actually help our community and ways that they can actually get involved in a positive way and keep the parents there. Okay, let me ask you a question on that. And I'm going to ask you for an estimate here. When we look at Um, any political party, look at the right wing or left wing, so I'm not picking any, people will say, well, there's the core, you know, Republicans on the right, and then there's this weird fringe. And then even core Democrats will say, well, you know, I'm a core Democrat. I'm not out there with um, AOC. I'm not out there with Bernie. I'm core, right? What percent would you say when you just said my community thinks like you and what percent is this vocal, you know, um, I want to say fringe, but this vocal group, what percent would you say that is? That if you got everybody in a room, had a secret ballot, how many people that are living gay, lesbian lives, families of their own, would say they're with you, And what, but maybe very nervous about saying anything? And what percent is this vocal, vocal group? Yeah, so I would argue 60 to 70 percent do not agree with this gender ideology. We get tons of support silently from the LGBT community, and it is because of the violence that we face every single day. Um, You know, I've had things show up at my door. I've had people come to my door. And so that alone, everything that we have gone through, everything that I have gone through is enough to get me off of this this journey and say, you know what? I'm too scared. This is this is going to affect my life. This is going to affect my mother's life and my parents' life, and it has. And I tell my family all the time, this is a journey that I will I will happily die on this hill for and lose everything for because this is my community. I would have fell victim to this. So 60%, 70% of my community does not support this. And that's why Gays Against Groomers is so important because we're actually providing that voice that no one has heard before. You, just one quick, you talked about RuPaul. Um, I just want to add to that. First of all, and this guy, Jeffrey Marsh, is insane. Dylan Mulvaney um, is a very key influence, particularly with young people, mm-hmm. all over TikTok. So, I mean, it, it, there was just recently a video that came out of him wanting acting like a little girl. Yes. I mean, so, and I'm curious when we talk about this from your perspective, you talked about, you know, mental illness and not having access to the help you need. How much of what's going on now here with what you see, you know, 15 genders plus, you know, the pronouns everywhere, what are very clearly grown men that are acting in very strange ways, creepy videos being targeted toward kids. How much of this that's going on now is undiagnosed mental illness that people are afraid Afraid to call mental illness because they're afraid of being labeled a bigot or whatnot. And now this is being normalized and infiltrating a movement that really started when it came to the gay rights movement as just live and let live. You know, that's a very good question. Um, and I'm in a very good spot to be able to answer something like this. And before I do, I just want to I want to let it know that this comes from love for my community. It does not come from hate. I know, you know, leading up to the show, people wanted to say that we're just a far right, you know, platform pushing far right ideologies. But this is a concern. I would say that a majority of it is I go down into the lion's den of the groomer capital of the world in California. And I speak to these people and a majority of people, in my opinion, um, are suffering from something. And just to me, I overwhelmingly just want to give them a hug because Mm -hmm. it's like, you guys are pushing so hard for things that don't make sense. Why? 
this doesn't this doesn't all add up and so i would i would argue a majority of it is and it's it's really unfortunate because they paint us as being these hateful people when we're really just trying to get them the help that they need right, so they can live that. a happy life yeah who's this on is this on parents is it on activists is it on teachers is it on politicians is it on big pharma who who, who is who is this on i wouldn't blame anyone individually i wouldn't blame a group individually i think it is overwhelmingly our our country's inability to get access to health care when you go and get get mental health services and you're able to talk to an actual mental health professional not someone that is a, a mental health advocate for their own personal gain but actually someone that wants to see you get better i think that that's where we're lacking as a, as a country because you see it with with the percentages in my community um you think six out of ten can't go see a therapist? That's deeply concerning. Why can't they? I would argue that we earn ten percent less. We're also forty percent as addicted to drugs. So all of these things, um, you know, hinder us from wanting to seek the help that we need. Um, and then also the culture of the LGBT community. If you go down and then you interact with a lot of our community, there is not a lot of uh, self accountability, extreme ownership in these things, and it's very much celebrated and um, accepted when you see your fellow gay you know digesting some sort of narcotic to party you 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 hype them up instead of saying hey you know what we should probably not do these types of things and we should probably get you some help and those types of things don't Frank, happen you, you said that you make 10 percent less yes do you say is it is it the lgbtq that makes 10 percent less or gay couples make 10 percent less the lgbt okay that makes sense because gay couples make more than hetero heterosexual couples. I don't know if you've seen this on U.S. Census Bureau. No. Yeah, gay couples make more money than than. Uh, 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 yeah, if you can pull this up, it's straight up from the Census Bureau. May, you, you you may be right on the LGBTQ side, but uh, here, if you show, there you go. That's the study. If you implement improve, you know, zoom in a little bit. 2019, uh, same sex have couples median household income. Uh, a higher median household income than opposing mm -hmm. sex. So the, the the reason why I specifically asked the question the way I did, uh, uh, yeah, let's look at this here. 29 same-sex couples uh, uh, accounted for just 1% married couple household. The small share is partly due to a fewer same-sex relations overall, which are also low among unmarried partners, lower marriage rate same-sex couples contribute 88% opposite sex. Uh, among same-sex couples, go to the number. Overall, same-sex married couples had a higher median income households than opposite sex married couples 107 to 96 respectively and same sex female married couples had a lower median household mm -hmm. income than say same, same sex male i ask that because uh i don't think it's i think it's right for lgbtq i don't think it's right for gays because they tend to typically you'll hear if you live in a community where there's there's a community here what's the community here that's a gay community wilton manors wilton manors right safe community right Westwood, there's a lot of communities, if the, they're there, it's a safer community. But the 40% drugs that you said, why do you think it's 40% more drug addiction? What do you think that is? Yeah, I would say it's self-soothing. So um, when you look and see that we can't get access to that health care, you see that we even consume alcohol a little bit higher um, than, than straight counterparts. And this comes from the American Psychological Association. I think that we're using that as a crutch. Um, and just to point out, this is for married couples, right? Yes. Yeah. So I was coming from more of a single um, individual yeah, um, perspective, not a married perspective. And so um, for me, that that's what I would argue. And it's also probably the culture, I would say, that, you know, doing these types of things is very accepted. So you're talking about access to health care. But what I'm seeing is a lot of people who don't want care. They're not seeking out care and saying, I don't have access. They're they're getting indoctrinated through the system where they're now led to believe that there's nothing wrong. So they, they don't feel that there's anything wrong in what they're doing. You know, we watch that video of, of Jeffrey or you watch Dylan Mulvaney. They, they certainly have access, but they don't want to address what's going on. There's something going on there. Right, I think we course. can all acknowledge. So it has to be a combination of, you know, we can talk about access, but also a desire to to fix what's going on. And there's going to be increasing number of people who don't want to fix it because the more these very odd, strange behaviors and multiple genders and drugs for kids gets normalized, the less people are going to seek health because that's going to be the new normal by which everybody lives. Right. So that's going to be a deep problem. You mentioned pharma, Pat. 
Just a note, pharma sp- stands to make an enormous amount of money off of all this. The drugs right. that are given to kids are become lifelong drugs. Remember, pharma owns a lot of media. Pharma owns a lot of Hollywood. They run their ads everywhere. So this whole thing is connected to big institutions that have the power to really shape what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, I just I just had I just had I just searched this on the data side before we move on. Uh, 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 I put put gay income versus just put gay income the way I put it, like the the words I put. Just take that and copy paste and put it in. Because again, I want to I want to. So a recent study has showed that in in U.S. full time employed gay men now earn ten percent more. Then their heterosexual counterparts, 20% of gay men and 25% of bisexual men between ages of 18 to 44 live in now below prop, uh, poverty levels compared to 15 levels of heterosexual, which is interesting seeing the pay gap that's taking place. You know, I, so one time, very interesting what happened to us. We're in California. My wife and I, we decided to get this house. And the first house we get in Northridge in 2009, we rent it. We walk in and it's a gay couple. No problem. One's a lawyer. One works at Disney. One works in real estate. Great. And we're walking through the house and they have a picture of Ronald Reagan there. <laughs> and I said, I'm looking at the picture of Ronald Reagan. And one of the guys looks at me and says, you think it's weird, don't you? <laughs> I said, you know, it is what it is to each his own. I said, but can I ask why Ronald Reagan? And he says, we're conservative in every possible way. We're just gay. It's the only thing that we're different of. You know, and that there's a there's a there's a group in California. What was that group called? The uh, Gay Republican Community. There's a name for Log it, you know. Cabin Log, that's right, yep. Law Cabin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you're seeing more and more of that taking place. These are successful people that are doing good for themselves. They just happen to, you know, like men. That's taking place. So, from my experience, again, each each one needs to be judged in a different way. Lesbians, gays. You know, needs to be judged in a different way. In a community where there's like gay working, you know, doing what they're doing, it's typically a safer neighborhood and it's a cleaner neighborhood from my experience. And I've seen a lot of different places. But so going back to this, because I do want to stay on this. I know it's very easy, <clears throat> Frank. You can be the gentle one. Let us be a little bit mean here. <laughs> you be nice. Uh, Jed, l- let's the rest of us take this question because I think we still haven't gone to the bottom of this question. Um, when you run a company, and the reason why I'm wired this way, I, I want to have the same mistake and not repeat again. And when you're doing anything you do the first time, you're going to have a lot of issues. So I want to know, who was that on? Who was this on? Who was this on? I don't want to put it on anybody. If we don't put it on anybody, then we don't know how to address it, right? So I'm going to go back again, but I'm going to ask it from Jed and I'm going to ask him from Tom. You can sit this one out. Come in if you're ready for it. <laughs> if you feel like you have some kind of courage for this one, jump in this one. Jed. Is this on activists? Is this on parents, the momentum that's being created? Is it on big pharma? There's a, uh, uh, what is that? Loop, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, Lupron. 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 You know, I just looked at what the revenues was for 2022, a billion dollars. Mm-hmm. It's a nice revenue for Lupron that's used for many different things. But, you know, big pharma, uh, parents, politicians, teachers, activists, Who's allowing this to happen and who's influencing it the most? So I think the momentum, the push is coming from pharma, but the responsibility and who's allowing this to happen ultimately rests with parents. It always rests with parents because even, you know, you can have drag shows for kids. You can have all this stuff going on. You don't have to take your kids there. You don't have to succumb. So it always, for me, ultimately rests with parents. Do you agree? I think there are opportunists, opportunists up and down the street on this. I think Big Pharma is being very opportunistic. I know a lot about Lupron. I'm not going to name names or go into detail, but you know I have some experience with this, with people that were very, very close to me, about the, the price for that drug and the incredible uh, counseling they do to talk about potential side effects of that drug. And now it's being thrown around like, chick, let's just get some Lupron. It's a puberty, puberty blocker. So I think Big Pharma is absolutely opportunistic. 
I also think the Democrat Party is absolutely opportunistic because there's some core Democrats that, that are not informed on this. They see it as a voting block. And it's part of us. It's part of the Rubik's Cube. It's part of the, um, the, the Tetris that makes up our voting block. So I'm going to do this. And when they don't really dive into it and understand the things you're talking about, about, um, about mental health issues and drug use that are, that are affecting it. And so they're opportunists. And I also think that this sits at the – I think parents have been asleep for the past 20 years and not really realizing what was going on in, in the schools, mm-hmm. not understanding what was happening to take a stand uh, to, about the kinds of things that were going to be taught to their children. And now you can take a look at you know, which way – the teachers swing and donate their their money and things politically. I think there's opportunists up and down, and each of the opportunists deserves some of the credit, or I guess you would say blame Pat, for how it shook out. But I think the spark, the spark has been the activist. Once upon a time, there was a well-intended effort, which ended with the Roberts decision. You can marry, right? 50 states. You don't have to wait. This isn't the ERA, Equal Rights Amendment through the 70s, waiting for those 37 states, 35 states to ratify it, right, Jed? It was suddenly John Roberts that just said, never mind the states, boom, you can get married. And now you can get married, you have access to spousal health care, I mean, uh, health insurance, because if your spouse works, he can say, this is my spouse, and now you get access to health insurance. Um, that was a big point, but there's activists that are going far beyond that. And so that's where I put it, is everybody down the street, I think, has a responsibility here, Pat, and the activists have been the spark. The activists can't get anywhere without mainstream media endorsement, though. So you, the activists are pivotal, but they will always be viewed as sitting over here in the corner. Oh, they're extreme until you get that mainstream media endorsement. So once you have the GMAs and once you have the cable news and once you have once you have the pharma funded media on board and the large umbrella saying this is healthy, this is normal, this is how you take care of your kids, then those activists who would have been relegated to the corners as extremists are now elevated and that all, that whole umbrella becomes the new normal. I would also add that the increasing number of followers fatherless homes, particularly in this country, is adding gasoline to the fire here. Because if someone is going to stand up to this stuff, it's going to be the dads in the home. The dads are going to say, this doesn't sound right to me. They're less likely to buy into woke ideology. Look at how women vote. Look at how men vote. This is just a reality, whether you like it or not. Not having those dads in the home provides, there's a lot of you know single moms out there. They're leaning on the system a lot more. They're not as financially independent. They're more pharma dependent. They're more likely to listen to and be malleable when you have, you know, schools and indoctrination camps coming their way. Not having that stable force as a dad in the home is leading to kids that are coming out with a lot more problems, kids that are more easily manipulated by social media, and also a whole structure that collapses under the weight of a massive indoctrination program. So, by the way, this is a strange time to be a kid. It's a little scary, right. honestly. Yeah. It, it is. It's, it's a strange time to be a kid to even understand these guys. But going back to it, Tom, so what you're saying is you're saying from the left, it's kind of like a voter bro- voting block. Like they're looking at this is a like a, a, a black vote. They got to win the black vote. They got to win the LGBTQ vote. I just searched to see what percentage of a, a vote uh, voters in America are, uh, identify as LGB. It says three and a half percent with 0.3 percent being transgender okay so one side saying they're trying to win the vote so they're going to get that vote for the next 20 30 40 years fine let's say that's one part of it next Mm -hmm. you said the big pharma is a part of it you were going a little bit more into that because i was watching side effects of lupron and i saw an article uh, rob i don't know if i send you this article or not if i did if you can pull it up it's life sites news i don't know if you have that one i thought i sent it to you uh, life sites news to see what Lupron does. So if you don't mind in your world, what is to the average person that doesn't know what Lupron is, what, what is Lupron? Yeah, Lupron was used to chemically castrate uh, pedophiles. And now we're, there's a small dose in it in puberty blockers. Yep. And so over time, I, this is this is the scariest part with, with this narrative, is people say puberty blockers does nothing. Um, I would argue that if you put a child on puberty blockers at 11 and then they stop at 19, 20, 
It's not just going to resume puberty. It's not a puberty delayer. You know, it's a puberty blocker. So these things are are changing the chemicals of your body and castrating you over time. Yeah, here's the article. It says thousands of deaths linked to drugs used as puberty blockers for gender confused kids. If you can go a little lower, uh, this is an article from 2019. It got some criticism. I'll give the backside of this as well. So September 20th, 2019. UK National Health Services, NHS, uh, is investigating drugs that are used to block normal sexual development among children and teens who are transitioning to the opposite sex that, when used in other applications, have been linked to 6,000 deaths. The drug is question, in question are used to lower the levels of testosterone and estrogen, which are building blocks of sexual development and sexual function. The use of these drugs in other areas of medicine to combat prostate cancer for instance, has been associated with serial mental conditions, including cases of nervous systems, psychiatric disorders, heart failure, seizures, joint pain, bone deterioration, and dozens of other adverse uh, uh, events. The FDA listed over 41,000 adverse reactions between 2004 and 2019 associated with Luprolite, uh, which includes Lupron and similar drugs used by gender clinics. Almost 26,000 of these were classified as serious cases which also includes 6,000 deaths. And I'll read this next part is FDA indicates that uh, amongst three to 17 year olds who had taken the drug for various medical conditions, there were reported almost 1,500 adverse reactions, over 700 being serious and 11 of those resulting in death. Of the cases resulting in death, the drug was used to delay puberty, treat uh, growth disorder or drug therapy as in hormone suppression therapy, among other things. Tom. Yeah, so th- this is, this this drug is a drug that was developed to, uh, and if you look up, there's a condition that affects young girls called precocious puberty. It's when the pituitary gland um, is out of sync with the biological age. And what the Lupron does, and it's given in the thigh like once a quarter with careful monitoring of hormone levels and specifically bone density. Because at puberty, you notice that the joint pain and everything, people are going to have chronic, almost arthritic joint pain because the bone development didn't happen. So not only is the bone density, but the bone size, growth plates are are completely out of sync. And so you're, you're not just causing a sex change. What you are doing is you are chemically changing the, the entire structure of that person's body. And they don't come out the same on the other side. In the case of precocious puberty, you do it once a quarter. They monitor it carefully. The puberty, you think of it like, um, defibrillating a heart that's beating improperly. Well, it kind of defibrillates the, and I know doctors probably listening are going to get on the chat and say, that's the wrong way to look at it. But it does, it sort of resets uh, the pituitary gland to say, hey, calm down. This is what we need you to do. And then it was used in adults, adult males, when you give them that, it be, it's the chemical castration for serial pedophiles that we don't know what to do with them. So we're going to give them this big time toxic drug and we're going to throw them in prison. And so the that's where big pharma is like anything. And by the way, this was eight grand a shot. That is the market price for Lupron was eight grand a shot. So parents that had this, that was a $24,000 a year. Lupron treatment. is eight grand a shot. Go see if you can find. Uh, I saw the revenues. It's $752 million in 2020 based on just this drug. Yeah, I'm sure he could go to like you know, drugs.com or, drug. you know, yeah. the, all, the online um uh, online legal pharmacies, you know, you could go, you could Type go in Lupron, it. price of Lupron per shot. Price of Lupron per shot. You'll see prices showing with and without uh, health insurance, by the way. There you go. Seventeen twenty nine. That may be monthly. Multiply that times three, and there's your, there's your once a Makes quarter Makes sense. Shot. Got it. Got it. Well, 1700 times three, that's forty five fifty two hundred dollars Got it. So, so, so to me, when you're looking at when you're looking at this, okay. So then, this leads me to the next conversation. Why, why such a big push for let the kids take it if they want to before 18 years old? Okay, let them do it. What's wrong with that? You should let them do it if they want to do it, and the parent supports it. Let them go through the process of taking this before 18 years old. Why is there such a big push for that? 
Um, I would argue that it's it's the income. You know, Big Pharma looks at this as, as a cash cow. And, and if you listen to a lot of detransitioners, they are not supported, um, you know, down the journey. A lot of them, you know, were guided, especially like someone like Chloe, Chloe Cole, was guided down a journey to, to go and transition, but yet didn't fully understand what she was getting herself into, didn't really have the mental capacity at 16, at 15 to say, you know what, I'm going to have a double mastectomy because I really want to be a boy. The, and so when you pair that with Big Pharma's dirty greed, you have all of these children now that are suffering medical consequences because they're using data from children that are suffering from medical illness that need these drugs. But now they're trying to give it to healthy, normal, functioning children, and now we have all of these things happening to them. So when you look at pharma, it's it's hard for people to understand this is a new drug. Not everybody's going to be familiar with this. It's the same game over and over again. So you have to look at it in terms of something that's that's very relatable. For example, birth control pills. Big Pharma encourages doctors and suppliers to consistently give out birth control pills to young women at a very young age. You have young, some young women walking into doctor's offices for acne, for an irregular cycle. They're not asked about their diet. You don't look at their stress level. You don't look at any other components that could be causing that. And they hand these birth control pills over to young kids who then young girls sometimes are taking these pills from the age of 13 years old straight through 25 years old. You're now seeing a ton of studies, by the way, that show that these women have bone density issues at a very young age. They're going in for scans at the age of 40 and they're having bone density issues because at an age when they were supposed to be at their maximum capacity to build bone, they were impeded from doing that because they were taking birth control pills. So you see the pharma recipe is, oh, let's just disseminate drugs, not investigate you know, what could actually be going on lifestyle-wise and otherwise to fix this problem. So now you bring in these other drugs, it's the same thing. You create a drug-dependent person. Women, on when you talk about birth control, are very hesitant to get off because then they're dependent. They don't want to mess up their bodies. They're like, oh, I'm in this routine. There's a lot of panic that goes into what are the side effects of coming off. You're going to have the same thing with this drug, whether it's Lupron or whatever is coming down the pike next from pharma. They want people consistently dependent on these drugs, afraid to get off of them. And it's a permanent, I think you've said it, Tom, it's a cash cow. It's a lifetime cash cow in a lot of cases. And then people who do detransition and go off of them will talk to you about it's not so easy to do that as as any person who's taken any drug, any pharma drug will tell you, you could take something as simple as a, a proton pump inhibitor for your stomach for acid reflux. There's a weaning process that goes into that. This is not easy stuff. Pharma knows it. And the more people they have reliant and dependent on these drugs from a young age, the more money they make. It's very and, simple. And, and by the way, I'll be big pharma, right? Well, my spreadsheet says that if you're on birth control pills right up to the point of uh, premenopausal, you know what? That just means I get you on the osteoporosis medication early. Right. And now. That's right. But wait, wait, wait. Your joints hurt? You have issues? No problem. I have a cocktail of osteoporosis medications. Right. I got stuff for your hot flashes. I've got stuff to deal with the pain in your joints. And, then, and, and, and. Because if you, if you take a look at it, you could look at each human being as a lifetime customer of pharma. That's right. You can you can look at it uh, exactly along you know those lines. Y you know I I think I didn't bring up media when I had my you know angry summary ten minutes ago <laughs> because you worked in media and you mm -hmm. saw pharma's influence on on media because of the amount of spend that they have and and we are what's the other country besides us that's allowed to New Zealand New Zealand's yeah, there's only two countries out there that are allowed to advertise like this and and you you lived in this mm -hmm. so I, I didn't bring up media because I don't I've studied pharma and I've studied a lot of other things, but I haven't lived in and studied me. So let, let's let's go let's go with the uh, with this uh, uh, <clears throat> next thing about uh, pu puberty blockers and what it does. So, question becomes the following: So, alcohol. What what age is legal age to drink alcohol? Twenty one. Okay. What age do I need to be to smoke cigarettes? Twenty one in California. Okay. How about if I want to uh, buy a gun? I think 18, yeah. 18. Yeah. 18. Okay. Most states. Uh, what if uh, uh, what if my dad, if I'm let's just say I'm 13 years old, okay, and I go to a bar and my dad says, "Okay, give me a shot of tequila." Can can we do that? No. But my dad said it's okay. Right. In 50 states your dad But but wait a minute. Could if, be I, if I go, if my <laughs> right. dad knows what's best for me and I go to a bar 
And my, I say, Dad, I want to do a double shot of tequila because it's been a long freaking day in school, bro. It's been tough. <laughs> Honestly, I need a double shot of tequila, right? And my dad looks at the bartender. Mary, it's okay. Give him a double shot of tequila. But he's only 13. I'm over 21. I'm 34. It's okay. Go ahead and give it to him. Mary's going to say, hey, buddy, I'm not going to lose my license for Do you, you realize how stupid that sounds? Like yep. what I just said right now, how right. stupid it sounds. Now, here's the ar argument. Dwayne Wade is a hero. He's a hero. He wants to allow his uh, younger kid to transition, and if the father approves, you should let him do that. <laughs> That's a good father in today's age. In today's age, uh, the International uh, Women's Day, Jill Biden recognizes a trans male who is now a woman as the woman of the year. Mm -hmm. do, do you realize the level of hypocrisy in these arguments? So if a 35-year-old father cannot go to a bar with his 13-year-old son and have a double shot of tequila because he's given the permission. What makes you give that argument to say, how is this argument creating momentum? I guess is what the question is. How? Yeah, so a lot of the studies that, that justify, you know, gender-affirming care for children are done through surveying these children that were indoctrinated. So you'll get a child, you know, starting, you know, puberty, and in two years they'll ask that indoctrinated child if, if, if you feel like you're going to commit suicide, if you feel better. And if you tell that child for years and years and years that you're a boy in a girl's body and now they're starting to become a girl, you just manipulated that child into being okay with what is happening with them. And so that's why this, this journey of just affirming is highly, highly dangerous because you're not giving the child the opportunity to grow up and make that, that devastating or, or hard decision for their life um, at an age where, where they can fully understand. Frank, you know what I would love you guys to investigate? Because this is what you do. I'd love for you. Remember earlier when I asked you a question, I said out of 100 gay men, how many of you think were born that way? How many of them is because of groomed or life or hardship or bad father or bad this or bad? Remember how I asked yes, you that sir. question? And you said 25%. 25% uh, uh, are the ones that were affected. 75% were actually gay mm -hmm. and they've always been gay. I think that number is a lot smaller than you think. It I, probably is. Yeah, I think that number is probably closer to 5 to 10%, my opinion. I could be wrong. I'm just telling you my opinion. I haven't done the research on this. But if, if you guys can, if somebody could go investigate that and figure out, like even right now, is there a scientific, is there a scientific way to figure out what it means to be gay? Like meaning... There is a scientific way to say what is it to be a man, right? Scientific. I'm born with a dangling, right? Yeah. There, there is a scientific, I think that's what they call it, right? Somebody clip that, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody is going <laughs> to That one's done. There's, that, a, there's a stem on the apple. Yeah. That so is funny. You're, you're, so a, a, a girl is born with a vagina. Right. Okay, like that movie, what was it, Kindergarten Cop? Hey, when he tells uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, he says what? He says, you know, boys have penises and girls have vaginas, right? Okay. That is a scientific way. And we can even go deeper to look at the chromosome count to say this. Is there a scientific way of defining what it is to be gay? Or do we all just have to say, well, you said you've been gay since you were a kid, so we have to believe it. it do you know what I'm asking, Tom? Is there a scientific way to say, based on your chromosome count and where you're at, you're gay? Um, I haven't seen anything like that um, on my end. It's it's something that I would foresee being very hard to determine, um, you know, because people go through these these life experiences and changes. You, you see it all the time where someone will be like, you know, 55 and say, you know what? I'm really gay, and then they start liking men. And it's like, how do you really gauge, you know, um, how do you quantify that experience to be able to make a determination on it? So you know who you see that a lot with, too, truthfully, in my experience? I've seen a lot of women who go through life. They have a family. They're married. Yeah. They have kids. And then at 50, they're lesbian, which is – and I reason that this is an interesting point that I know you've brought up a couple of times, Pat, I think, is because if you look at the stuff like with Bill Maher that we talked about before, the numbers are exploding – if you look at the numbers of when you talk about trans, how many people you know who are legitimately have, you know, body dysphoria or have all of these issues, those are also ballooning. So there has to be a way to gauge like what is real 
what is happening in someone's body versus what is societally induced in someone, particularly with re- with respect to, you know, I'm a boy, I'm a girl, I'm this. It's, it's You can't just treat people based off nothing, right? They're, they're now getting drugs and stuff. It has to be grounded in some science here. Have I told you the story about the gay bar we went to in Nashville, Tennessee? I know you don't know the story, but do you know no. the story? Okay. So I'm the Army, and one of our guys, his name is Chip, he says, when you're ready, I'm going to take you to the best underground club in all of Nashville. <laughs> I'm like, bro, I'm ready. I've gone to all the clubs. I've gone to Vegas. I've been, trust me, I'm ready. He says, no, you're not. Said, I'm telling you, I've been to a lot of crazy clubs. I guarantee you've never been to a crazy club like this. I said, dude, I'm, te- I'm, in, I'm from L.A. He says, okay, let's see. Anyways, three months later, he's like the guy that's been there longer than us. He takes me and this other guy, Jeff, to this club. We go to this club. It's... Studio 54 on steroids. <laughs> and by the way, when I tell you Studio 50, if you've seen the movie mm-hmm. where people are going at it on the floor, they're doing this over here, they're doing that, they're doing this, trans drags, all of it is going on <laughs> at this club, okay? And there's a couple thousand people there. It's bonkers how crazy this club was. So we go in. We go in, and obviously, uh, you know, gay men will come up to you and say, hey, handsome, hey, this, hey, that. You know, you <laughs> know what? voice. Yeah, yes, it's flirting in their own way. And then there's those that don't have the deep voice, and right. they talk to you as well, right? Like, all right, cool. <laughs> so I'm like, listen, man, I'm just here for the girls. And it was great because girls would go there to not be bothered. Right. Because they just want to be left alone. Well, this allowed us to go there, and if they change their minds by 1130, there's an option. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> and I got okay, cool. We'll oh go my there. gosh, there's Our, plenty, plenty <laughs> that have that same outlook. Right. I assure you. I assure so I'm you. like, you know what? What a brilliant strategy by this guy. So I'm like, why does this guy always around these beautiful girls? Anyways, here's what happened on the drive home. One of our guys goes to the bathroom, and this guy approaches him, and he says, uh, you know, are you gay? He says, no, I'm straight. He says, you ever been with a man before? He says, no. He says, how do you know you're straight if you've never been with a man before? Okay. And in the 45-minute drive back from Nashville to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, this guy was struggling with that question. Really? And oh, I'm, wow. like, I'm like, bro, what are you doing? <laughs> said, this is, he's supposed to do that. That's kind of like how we flirt with girls. <laughs> we use our, like, you know, the line from uh, uh, Top Gun, he says, you know, uh, you, you, whatever, you, 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 I don't date pilots. Well, if the government can trust me, why can't you? Right? All these lines are good lines. So I'm like, okay, cool. I'm listening to the lines. I'm like, dude, that's his pickup line yeah. to convert straight guys. And he's like, no, but, but what if he's right? I'm like, wow. you don't understand what you're doing, bro, right now. You're going to go in a very bad place here. It's going down the rabbit hole. Dude, until we're married, guess, we're all in sales. Guess what <laughs> rabbit hole he ended up going to? To the rabbit hole to find out for himself. Oh, <laughs> I'm not even kidding with you. So he goes back. Sounds like more than a rabbit hole. Yeah, well, it is. Well, he goes back and he fully wants to find out. And then, anyways, I don't want to go into because some of the people that are listening will know who I'm talking about. He ends up saying, no, you know, I'm not. I'm straight. Okay. But he full blown went everywhere. Okay. <laughs> he was so all like, in. I'm like, did you really have to do this to go there? He said, well, <laughs> yes. So the reason why I asked that question is because I think. <laughs> It's uncomfortable to talk about this today because I know what's going to happen after this podcast today. I'm going to get emails. Why are you even doing this? Stick to the business. Stick to that. It's okay. You're talking politics. Why are you touching this? You know these guys are going to come and they're going to do that and they're going to do this. I'm asking a simple question. If you're saying 75%, 25% because of life, 75% they were born that way, I'd love to know the scientific formula on what categorizes a person to be gay and then we will i mean i think it's like dude what do you want to say that person based on that or it's just a choice an individual is making that later on a lot of it could have been persuasion by somebody else because from my experiences i've been you know i've been to many different places and i've been around straights gays bi's all of this stuff and i understand i understand what the approach of trying to convert and baptize the other individual to get them to think uh so my, my question is more, I would love the research to know exactly what that number is. And I would love for scientists who are Republican and Democrat to work together, fund the budget to find out exactly what needs to be the scientific formula for us to say people are born gay. I'd be so curious to know that.
I think that that's something under the wheelhouse that we can definitely, um, you know, deep dive into as an organization. We're definitely um, just, you know, got nonprofit, um, you know, for the IRS. So we're definitely seeking large funding to be able to, you know, pull things out and accomplish things like this, because I think that there is a gray area that, um, you know, that isn't being investigated. Yeah. And that's something that, you know, GAG could definitely look into because it goes under the grooming wheelhouse. You know what I would want to know? I would want to know if you can pull up if you can, for a fact, get to the bottom of it and fund this with scientists, I'd love for your organization to come back and tell us how much that would cost. Okay? You got it. Yeah. I would love for you to come back and say, we can fund it with this scientist, that scientist, and I want it to be both sides because I don't want it to be any bias. They're all Republicans or they're all Democrats or they're all this. I want it to be people at our for the vaccination, they're not for the vaccination. I don't want all of them to be, well, the vax wasn't a good thing you took. Or I don't want all of them to be, you should have taken a vax for COVID. Because, you know, vax became political. This LGBT is political. Everything is now political. Of course, yeah. If you tell me how much it would cost to find out to get to the bottom of it, I don't know. Maybe I'll either contribute or we'll go help you raise the funds. But I'm really, really curious. Yeah. And what I'm even more curious about has this study ever been done? Rob, can you even pull it up? Like, is there what is like a, what would be the word, by the way, to even search for it? Is it gene? Is it I chromosome? What would it be? Like, I feel like it would be something like, like in your brain activity would probably be like where you would want to target, um, you know, certain receptors, I would assume, if you were going to gauge. Because at the end of the day, it's it's based on your attraction, right? PBS. So pull up that one. Let's see what PBS says. Can you pull that up? There is no gay gene. There is no straight gene. Sexuality is just complex. Study confirms. Can you zoom in a little bit? So we obviously know this is PBS, so we know what side they're going to be leaning to. There's no single gene possibility. But you know, the first thing you need to know about the largest genetic investigation of sexuality ever, which was published Thursday in Science, the study of nearly a half a million people closest uh, the door on the debate around the existence of the so-called gay gene, okay? In its stead, the report finds that human DNA cannot predict who is gay or heterosexual. Sexuality cannot be pinned down by biology, psychology, or life uh, experiences. This study or other shows because human sexual attraction is decided by all these factors. This is not a first study exploring the genetics of same-sex behavior, but the previous study were small and underpowered the study's co-author and genetics research fellow at the Broad Institute and Mass General Hospital on Wednesday, just to give you a sense of the scale of our data, this is approximately 100 times bigger than any previous study on the topic. The study shows that the genes play a small and limited role in determining sexuality, genetic her her heritability. All of the information stored in our genes and passed between generations can explain 8 to 25% of why people have same-sex relation based on study results. Are they going to give it to us or no? Can track down a single gene? Keep going down. Let's see if there's like points, what they're going to say. Is it worth keeping in mind? Of course, ethical concerns. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. If, if I know what physically I can say somebody is straight, somebody is a man or somebody is a woman, I'm not talking about straight or gay. I'm talking about what is a man and what is a woman, okay? We can physically look at somebody when they're born, when the son, when your baby is born, they will say, you have a boy, okay? And when we see the picture, they'll say, this is a boy because of, you know, you see the picture, there's a dangling, right? Or this is a girl, right? And you go, you got a girl, you got this, okay, great. Now, oh, it's a boy, phenomenal, you celebrate. But is there a way to say, your kid's going to be gay because his chromosomes number is this and test is this, this is what's going to happen. Great, let's celebrate it. Right. Yeah, I think... Um that's going to be a really hard thing to, to accomplish because I, I I did read a study like through the the National Library of Medicine that that kind of reinforces a little bit here that there are many influences that can help determine um, someone's sexuality and I think um, I think that that would probably be most accurate that sexuality isn't just something that is so binary that oh you can only be straight and you will always be straight i think we've have enough you know people in the world that have changed that like we spoke about but um when it comes down to like but why though why well why though so 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 let's go to that so a 55 year old man is married two kids all of a sudden says i'm gay okay we had a very, like you talked about earlier, right? Okay. We had a very good friend. Drop that gorgeous girl. Married to a, a, a very famous guy in L.A. who's done very well. Billionaire money guy. All of a sudden, one day, she's like, no, nah, I'm not. I'm, 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 I'm lesbian. I like women. 
she left her husband with two kids and went and got with another girl and they got married and now she's lesbian, right? Okay, but what causes that? What causes a 55-year-old who has been married with kids, like the movie Whale, right? You saw the movie Whale. I don't know if you've seen the movie Whale or not with the, the guy that just, didn't he just win the Oscar? He Brandon Fraser, right? Brandon Fraser, that he was a married guy with a daughter, and when she's eight or nine years old, he's a teacher. He falls in love with a student who's 23. He leaves the wife and a daughter to go be with him, and then the guy he falls in love with ends up having AIDS. He dies, and then later on. He eats so much, and he kills himself right in front of the daughter. This whole story, I don't know if you've seen this story. No. Depressing story at the highest level. Don't recommend watching it. Brandon Fraser cr crushed the acting, but the storyline makes zero sense on how depressing of a story this is, right? But why does a 55-year-old man all of a sudden choose to be gay? I, I wouldn't have the answer to that. I mean, I feel like the biggest proponent, if you wanted to take a guess on that, is is social um, influence, is, is what is going to you know, groom someone into to behaving or seeing something in a different light. Um, I would be a fool to say that, you know, when you idolize something that people don't want what you're idolizing. And so that's marketing. And so it, I would I would argue that it would, based on that person's individual life experiences that brought them to that decision. I know many of women that um, face, like, sexual assault, and that is a reason why that they go down the journey of being lesbian. That's a pretty dramatic lesbian. event, though. It is. And so but it's I, not genetics. No, but yeah. it, it would it would be a proponent of that mental state and changing your mental outlook because of the what happened to you. But, but you see, I don't have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. then, then that, to me, becomes a religion. You change your religion is what you did, meaning— there's a lot of people that are atheists. At 55 year old, they become Christians. Well, why'd you become a Christian, right? You read about C.S. Lewis. I don't know if you know who C.S. Lewis is with the book Mere Christianity mm -hmm. or Chronicles of Narnia. They made a book about this guy. It's a phenomenal movie. Uh, they, the movie they made about him, uh, Divorce Letters. I think he's got all these great books that he wrote, right? The Great Divorce. He's got all these things that he wrote. Screw Tape Letters. If you've read it, it's a phenomenal book, Screw Tape Letters. This guy was an atheist, Oxford. Then he becomes a Christian. You're a pretty smart guy. What happened? How do you change? Yeah, I joined a faith and I found God. H how do some of these boxers, I was born a Christian, now I'm a Muslim. What happened? Well, a life-changing event happened, right? That's a religion. That's not genetics. That's not how you were born. I am born a man, okay, but people influence me to say, wow, I like that guy. He asked the questions. He converted me, right? That is a religion I'm joining, but it's not how I'm born. That's the question I'm putting out there. Right. Makes sense. And would you argue then that straight would be a religion too? No. To me, being born a man, okay, is gay gender? Is gay a gender? No. What is gay? Gay is a sexuality. Gay and a so straight would also be a sexuality, Man and woman are genders. So male and female, but man on the and application, woman. on the application, you know how I put, you know, uh, male, female. Now there's like other this, this, that. That's no. So it's not like male, female, straight, gay. It's male, female. Those uh, are your two binary genders. Yep. And that's the way I see it. And then you have these people that are going to determine their sexual orientation. And now from there, you're going to take someone that could be a man or could be a woman. And they could be lesbian or straight or mm -hmm. gay. And so I I could definitely, you know, see the lens that, you know, if we wanted to claim sexuality as some sort of religion, some sort of belief, it would have to be blanketed across everyone. Yeah, but I'll show you here. Like this, these are, uh, I'm giving you applications where they say, what is your gender? Mm -hmm. And then it says female, male, trans, female to male, male to female, intersex, other uh, uh, you know, so and then you have the sexual orientation, which you're talking about, which like is gay. completely different totally than like get, trans. Yeah. Okay, totally get it. So you're saying uh, uh, gay is a uh, religion, then straight is also religion. Is yeah, because they're saying. both sexual. If we're going to paint gay as being a religion, yeah, then you, I feel like on the because I'm the guy that you would have to flip it the same way on the other coin. And if gay is a religion, then so is straight. Because then what you're arguing for gay, you can also argue for straight. And it has to be same on both ways for it to be factual. Right. I can go to a place right now that would really get me in trouble right now if I, if I wanted to go there. Maybe we can <laughs> talk offline when I, yeah. when I bring, bring up my thoughts on this here. But to me, an event, doesn't, uh, an event has to happen for me to become gay. An event doesn't have to happen for me to be straight. An event has to happen for me to be gay. 
right? A crisis, a life-changing event, a person I meet, a conversation, a groomer, groomer, a person that does something for me to question myself to say, maybe I am, and I don't know, and then I shift. Versus, I want to know naturally, are there symptoms and genetics or studies that I can say, this right. person's going to have signs of being gay. That's what I want to know. Because, you know, if it is, if the statement, specifically going back to the statement of, I was born this way. Cool. I actually want to do studies to see what that means. You know, people say I was born right. this way. So, so that's that's so interesting because you know this trans movement definitely abolishes that I was born this way mentality, um, and it's that's why I argue like the LGBT community is very full of a lot of contradictions um, because if if you're born this way, if you're born gay, then why are, why are people born in the wrong body? You know, and it's like it's it's to me. I'm very logically consistent with the with the statements that I make, and making sure that they are the same on both sides of that coin. And I think that that's why you're seeing a big shift in people saying things like LGB without the T, um, gays against groomers. We definitely include the T. Um, we just don't think that this is something for children to be influenced by. But consenting adults is different. Yeah, this is. Uh, uh, we went through a whole different rabbit hole. Yeah. We just right. and, and, and trust it was me, interesting, yeah. Frank, trust me when I tell you this. Off camera, at 11.30 at night, having a cigar, this conversation gets a lot more comfortable when you're talking to home team and everybody is safe Definitely. than a place like this because in a, in a, in a society like today, um, we have to be forced to think a certain way that somebody wants to tell us to believe. And I have a very hard time with that. I, I got kicked out of Bible study from 7 to 10 years old because I would say, how the hell does a, if you tell me God exists and we just got bombed 167 times, explain to me how God exists and all these people died. So I was kicked out of Bible study. They wouldn't even send me back. They would tell my mom and dad, your son doesn't need to be in class because he questions everything in the Bible. So they finally said, your son can't come to Sunday school. So I've been that guy my entire life to question because I'm curious. If I'm born this way, prove it to me. I will trust science from both sides, not just PBS, not just Fox. I want to Pew Research, Gallup, those who supported the vax, those who didn't support the vax, those who voted for Republican, those who voted for Democrat, scientists, let's put some money in there, get to work and argue it and tell us. You know what? Here's what happens. 99.8% of people who become gay were converted because somebody groomed them. Cool. Or no. There's 12% that are born this way. Fine. Now we have the science to go based off of that rather than all these other things that are being forced down our throat. Um, I don't want to upset you. It's just... Oh, I'm, no, you're I'm, fine. I'm going through it myself right now. So be patient with my level of curiosity. Oh, you're totally topic. okay. Uh, so so why don't we... Uh, uh, if we can go to this next thing. This is a disturbing video. Uh, before we play this, parents, I, the reason why I'm showing this is because I think parents are not aware of this enough. Uh, here's a guy who's a convicted uh, uh, child predator being interviewed. Tom, have you seen this before or no? Uh, Jed, have you seen this I have before? Not. Okay, I have not. Frank, have you seen this? No. It's so disturbing. It's not even funny, mm -hmm. but it's so necessary because the interviewer gets exactly how he groomed young boys before molesting them. It's a two-minute clip. Again. A uh, 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 brace for impact, parents. I highly recommend you watch this for your own self and start teaching your kids before they c come across somebody like this. Go ahead, Rob. How did you get them alone? Grooming. Um, I would check out their family situation. I would check out their clothing to see how well they were, you know, financially. I would check out their social interaction with other kids. You know, when we were on the ballparks or on the, on the gym floor, you know, I would make sure which ones I wanted to molest. I would give them special attention, congratulate them, talk to them when I know that I would never be allowed to talk to anybody else. You know, aside from everybody, I would give them the attention that a, an official is not supposed to give anybody and it made them feel like wow he's paying me attention you know it, it is a direct form of grooming were there certain characteristics that you looked for in children before molesting them in children yes but more i we go. also looked at their families there you go if i thought the father was a threat i would not 
approach the Bingo. child. If I thought that the child had friends that he would tell, I would not approach him. If I thought the child had friends that were in the same capacity he was, I would approach him for the simple fact that if I could molest him, I could lure him into believing, grooming him into believing that he would enjoy it. And therefore, I could manipulate him into having his other friends come oh and be God. molested by me as well. So perhaps a, a, a child that doesn't really have a whole lot of friends, maybe not really a strong family, things like that. Yes, no spiritual values. Um, ah, no spiritual values. Weak in education, you know, needs help in many ways. D um, even from uh, split parenting, you know, has a mother who may be having problems with the family, you know, well, here comes superhero in to help out, you know, wow, well, thank you very much. No problem. You ever need me to take him away for the night so you can oh, have a night oh out? My, oh, my No gosh. problem. It works. Bingo. Thoughts. That's why I said that about the fatherless homes. Um, it happens all the time. And it happens with everything. I mean, you have to think about like a dad in a home and what it, what that means. I mean, even if you say you have a daughter and she's going to date somebody, that guy is out to do no good, comes to the front door and meets PBD <laughs> or meets my <laughs> husband. Good luck, you know, or meets Tom. Good luck um, or any any dad out there. So a dad is really like a check on on really some bad stuff. A dad has really good, strong radar a dad who is wired properly and has his masculinity and all that intact, which is what I talk about all the time, is going to say, no, stop. And people will read that. People out to do harm will read that. And if they see a home where there is a mom who's home, who's alone, who's struggling financially, where there's a lot of holes there, that be, that creates an opportunity for some really terrible stuff to happen. So that's very interesting that we just By the way, he went, he went to jail for 12 years for molesting a number of kids Disgusting. in the 80s. Go ahead, Tom. You know, which, which really, this just shows you just how busy and how much the citizenry isn't paying attention. Not all of them. And all of us are into this. I'm not putting anyone above any others in terms of parents. Everybody gets busy. Everybody doesn't pay attention. You have today groups that are coming to high schools to talk about the dangers of social media. And they're talking about predators because predators are bad. And you've got same-sex couples there that are just that are coming to there concerned about their kids being on Facebook or kids being on social media and, and, and meeting predators and going off and having bad things happen. And they're concerned about that. But then 10 minutes later, right, nobody, nobody you see where I'm going, Jed? No, it's like they have this concern for the safety of their child. They have this concern for it. But then when they come back to what is the school teaching, what is the, the average guidance counselor doing, what are people not doing, and what are they not telling you, they're not connecting the two dots there. They say, listen, grooming is grooming. You're concerned about predators over here. You're concerned about social media safety. You're concerned about really terrible things happening on one hand. But on the other hand, you've kind of not turned a blind eye but you haven't been paying attention to see it's 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 come in on the other side mm -hmm. you know this video points out some really good um topics when it comes to who has access to this information easily who has the profession where they can determine these types of things that this individual did to to attack children and i would argue that teachers have all this information in abundance of all of their classrooms and when you pair something like that knowledge with pride flags happening in classrooms, um, which I'm a huge proponent that we should ban pride flags out of classrooms, you are opening up the door for these teachers to have sexual conversations with students that is highly inappropriate, that is not effective to their education. I argue that if, if you're hanging a pride flag in your classroom, I want you to explain that to me as if I'm a six-year-old. And it's going to boil down to sexual preference. And that is no conversation for a stranger, an outside entity from the family home to have that discussion with the child. And this video fully proves that when you look at an educator, as a parent, you should be questioning teachers more so than any person that your child is around. You should be very involved in the things that your child is learning because they have access to ultra-sensitive information that can jeopardize your child's well-being positively 
or negatively. That's 100 percent true, because I used to be the dean of a school and I would, you know, academic dean and I would work with kids age seventh, seventh grade through high school. And I knew everything about their families. I knew everything about their parents. I knew what was going on in their home. I knew if that child was troubled. I know if they're on medications, ADHD medication, whatever it may be. I know what their academics looks like. I know how many times they're in and out of the office. If there's an emotional trauma or emotional problem, I know some of what's been discussed with a guidance counselor. This is 100% true, and this is why I think you've seen this blow up in homeschooling because there's such Mm -hmm. a deep concern about what's going on in schools now, and parents think that they can't monitor it adequately. They're like, well, I'm not there all day. Ultimately, you are giving your children away to an institution for a period of time in the day. You can try to be as present as possible. You can do those parent-teacher conferences. You can have those in-person interactions, but many parents are feeling like, you know, especially if they have no choice but to put their kids in public school right now, they're feeling very, very concerned and afraid, which is why the homeschooling industry is blowing up the way that it is. And this is for you. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, everything. No, go ahead, Tom. And, and, you know... um, the BizDoc babe, she's a teacher, and she'll tell you, she said, you know, that there's this odd chasm that gets formed. Parent calls you, said the kid was in a fight. She'll say, here's what we know, here's what we observed, here's what the witnesses said, here's another teacher on the playground said. You get chapter and verse, you know, in little kids, you get these little things called an ouch report if they got hurt. Um, number one, they'll tell them about the grades, they'll tell them about the tests, they'll tell them if they stole from another kid, they'll tell them if they cheated on a test. You can go through the whole thing and it says, has he been acting out? You can't tell, then you're not supposed to tell them the next the next parts. And she said, you know, this is really troubling to a lot of teachers. Teachers are not unified on this. They're troubled. They're saying, listen, the parents should know everything. And there's a difference between kid that's got a very bad stepmother or an abusive relationship or something odd is happening at home. And and there's, there's some intervention eventually is going to be needed, maybe not CPS, but there's a difference between that and then suppressing information, you can you can share everything and anything. And by the way, the schools are, we got to talk to the parents because this kid is disruptive and all the other parents are complaining. So we need to talk to this parent so that their little boy who's just ADHD will stop disrupting the class. And there's this urgency to do it. But then the parent then wants to get a briefing on everything. You tell the parent everything except. And it's parents now are reacting to this saying, no, wait a minute, this this is kind of crazy. And we shouldn't paint all teachers like this because there's a lot of teachers out there that are saying, no, we shouldn't be putting a limit right. on this. But those teachers, some of them who are, it doesn't matter their political affiliation, they're liberals and are saying, listen, we got to get the parents involved in this because, but I can't say anything and I can't say that that's my feeling. Mm-hmm. And so certain teachers are being kind of p- pushed back from expressing it by what is being characterized as a very loud minority. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they have no yeah. power. Those, some of those teachers have no power because they're working within the confines of a system that prohibits them. They can either lose their job or they can go teach at a private independent school, which I worked at, where there's a little bit more flexibility because, you know, there aren't these, you know, top down government mandated procedures that people have to follow. But it is an increasing problem. I want to yeah. read this story. I want to read a couple of these stories to you. Here's one from AP News. School library books, uh, book bans are seen as targeting LGBTQ content. L- uh, Iowa Republican Governor Kim Reynolds pushes an especially sweeping crackdown on content in Iowa school libraries. The bill she's backing could result in the removal of books from schools, libraries in all of the state's 327 districts if they're successfully challenged in any one of them. Under a bill backed by Reynolds, the titles and authors of all books available to students in classrooms and libraries must be, would be posted online, and officials would need to specify how parents could request a book's removal and how decisions to retain books could be appealed. When any district removes a book, the state's education department would add it to a removal list, and all of Iowa's 326 school districts would have to deny access to the book unless parents gave approval the parents are the governing authority in how their child is educated, period, said Senator Amy Sinclair. Parents are responsible for their child's upbringing, period. Terry Patrick, a mother of two, expressed a befuddlement about why anyone would want to make sexually explicit books available to children. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, you know, I, I we put in a lot of work, especially here at my home, um, in Orange Unified uh, School District. We actually were able to flip our board to be more conservative, and they actually terminated our superintendent and are in the process right now of replacing that individual. They did this because of a lot of the sexual things that were happening to children within these books. And so our board actually had 
to make drastic decisions and offloading an app to get rid of these books. And the question really comes is all of these parents for the last year or two that have been complaining about these porn style books that are available to students, why hasn't anyone with their right mind saying that this should not be available to students? This should not be available to five-year-olds. And if you're going to make it available to your your students, it should be at an appropriate age. But but here's the part, though. I'm open to being sold if you can logically sell it to me. How are they selling that that's normal, that you should be okay with that? How are they're they paint, selling yeah. it to parents? Yeah, so there's this thing. I call it gay privilege. When you paint something as inclusivity, you paint, you paint it as pride, you paint it as love, as my community, you automatically get this precedent that if you do not go along with this, then you're homophobic or you're transphobic, and no one wants to fall under that category based on how our society perceives these people. Now you have people like us, like mm -hmm. Gays Against Groomers, that says, oh, no, 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 no. This book that is showing two children have sex this has absolutely nothing to do with pride and inclusivity. This has everything to do with indoctrination. They associate it with book banning now, those people. You know, they'll say that people, oh, these are like conservatives I who want to yeah. ban oh, yes. books and that. And in the meantime, if you looked back, I mean, would you put Playboy magazines from back in the day into a child's school library? No, you wouldn't. There was some moral barometer of what was acceptable. There was a barometer. If you sent your kid into a neighbor's house, and we had a, we had, we found out in our neighborhood when I was growing up, there was a guy that was a little strange. And a friend of mine found it out because she went and babysat there, and there were just Playboy magazines everywhere and these were all young and the parents said you're not going in there anymore you're not babysitting you're not doing any of that stuff but we had a moral barometer of what was acceptable you have a school library and you have kids of a certain age bracket every book in that library should be pertinent for kids of that age bracket I don't know why this has gotten so complex and so hard and it seems to me that what you're saying is mm -hmm. accurate that everyone's afraid to challenge just this immoral stuff or this stuff that's just not appropriate for that age group because they're afraid of what, how they're going to be labeled then they're going to be ostracized then and, you know, someone on social media is going to make a video about them. Then they're going to you know, have yes. a problem at their job. It's going to balloon. And that person's suddenly going to lose their job, their financial stability. So everyone's like, let me just shut up. And who's getting hurt are the kids because then they go into that school library. And as a 14 year old reading a book that's appropriate for a grown adult and not for them. So ultimately, you have to speak up. People like you who you know run these organizations, parents have to walk into these school libraries and say, I'm going to rip my kids out of this school if you don't stop putting inappropriate content in this library. And if a whole if a whole school of parents showed up and did that, they'd have to change. What are, the, what are all the schools going to be empty? No, it doesn't work like that. You band together and you do something about it. That that kid must have lived in a high end community where the parents had Playboy magazines. Uh, we <laughs> Out. we we found L A Express. We couldn't afford Playboy magazine when we were 14, 15 years old. But I don't know if you little know LA kids Express. though. She was going to babysit five and six year that's, olds. That's you know? a problem. But you know, even with that. The responsibility of that is still parents screwing that up, yeah. which is fine. Let the parents screw it up. But we knew Teachers, that it was wrong. That's right? right. Of course. We knew it was of wrong. Of course. Now, a teacher doing that and thinking it's appropriate right. to put it in a book to say, you know, picture two boys. What? That's the part of how are you selling these parents for some parents to say, yes, Tom, do you have any uh, thoughts on this? Yeah, I think it goes both ways. And I think, you know. For yeah, a lot of them do go both ways. That's a different community. That's a bisexual. Is, <laughs> is that <laughs> Uh, that's next Thursday. Oh, <laughs> go ahead. I'm sorry. I thought you were already the B. That's what the B stands for. There you go. We're go all ahead, learning Tom. here, right? <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it, it, you never know, though, unless if you, Tom, try. But go ahead. You were saying. I, I think it's important to make to make that point, right, as, you know, appropriateness for all, because the, you know, you, you don't want any one community to say, oh, we're being singled out, being discriminated against. Well, they can claim to feel that way, but frankly, for libraries, we want age-appropriate, you know, material all across spectrum. You know, tr heterosexual, homosexual, all that stuff. We don't want any of that yeah. to be in front right. of kids. You know, th that's that's the point, and it's not you know, banning just gay books or banning just this. It is basically saying, hey, there's an appropriate age for this. You know, you, parents for the longest time, help me out, Jed, because you were an administrator, could opt in or opt out of certain videos that they would do for right. health yeah, for girls. Sign and, a form. Yeah. In yeah. seventh grade, hey, let you know, next week, April 11th, yeah. we're going to do this. This is the film. This is what it's about. It's been used since 19... 85 and so parents and have a phone you know what no i'm gonna have the conversation with my daughter don't she's not gonna watch that film with you um 
combined. And so for the longest time, there was this moral barometer and sensibility, but it was on both ways. It's like sexualized content, not going to be in front of kids Mm -hmm. at an inappropriate age, period. So nobody is singling out LGBTQ books. Nobody is banning books in the name of McCarthyism on one side of a political line here. This is kids are kids and adults are adults and there's content for either. They sell it, by the way, to parents because the same way they sold condoms, condom distribution in schools. They say this is happening in society. So we're just showcasing what's happening in society. They also say, well, not every kid has parents. Some kids right. don't have the structure at home to explain these things. So it's our job now to stand in and have these conversations with kids. That's how it's sold. I just want to point they're out. They're going to do it anyway. Let's make sure that they're doing sure it safely. Supervised. And they mm-hmm. use safe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just I just want to point out these books that we're talking about are not simply you know, a dad and a dad raising a kid, taking them trick-or-treating in a coloring book. We're talking about a book that is showing kids sexual fetishes, how to use sexual objects, you know, having sex in these books, all cartoon is pictures. Is this a joke or are you being I serious? I am not no, joking No, he's not. Real. The, the speech you saw me give in Poway Unified yeah. School District, we blew up what? these pictures in, in two feet by three feet and displayed them for the school board and said, these are, bo- these are pictures you have in your classroom books that is available to students. And when you look at these people and they say you're homophobic it's like this has nothing to do with sexuality we just don't want porn in classrooms with with kids it's inappropriate and they're using my this is why when we were talking my community the lgbt community has been hijacked well let me go to the next story here with what's going on in florida florida set to dramatically expand its don't say gay laws here's what they will do this is time magazine article obviously uh, uh, or else it has nothing to do with don't say gay laws. That's just what they're promoting. Republicans, lawmakers in Florida are planning to expand provisions in their Parental Rights in Education Act or don't say gay law, which will restrict what teachers can and cannot say in their classrooms about gender, sex, and sexual orientation. The bill would heavily restrict in-school discussions about sexual orientation or gender identity until ninth grade and bad teacher, ban teachers from addressing students by pronouns that differ from those they were assigned at birth. The advocates for and against these bills that Times spoke to believe this uh, legislation will pass. LGBTQ and advocate plus advocates especially fear that the bill would have adverse effects on LGBTQ families and more than 16,000 Florida youth that identify as transgender. Research by the Williams Institute at the UCLA, UCLA School of Law found that more than half of the LGBTQ parents surveyed consider moving out of Florida because of the don't say gay law. Jed, would you be heartbroken if these parents left Florida? Leave. See you later. <laughs> Bye. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. No, this is why it's important to choose where you live right now. This is why I'm, it's state to state. You see massive differences, by the way, in terms of what governors are and aren't willing to tackle. I mean, look at what we just saw there. They want what? Third graders getting this information? The, 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 that is talking about up until ninth grade. They're trying to make stuff age appropriate for kids. They're also trying to say if you're a boy, you can't just leave the house at home a boy and everybody's, you know, oh, this is Jimmy. And then you go to school and somebody calls you a girl all day long. The parents don't know about it. Nobody knows what's going on. These are parental rights bills. These are mm-hmm. places that you can live. By the way, states like Florida, and and there are a lot of red states. Some red states, by the way, are slacking behind on this stuff. But there are a lot of red states you can go to, and you just know. Listen, if something's going on with my kid as a parent, the school is going to inform me. My kid's not going to have a whole separate life at school than they have at home, and there's not going to be this big black hole of nonsense going on at school that's completely inappropriate for my eighth grader. Let's say totally normal. Anybody with their head on straight would not have a problem with this stuff. Frank. Um, I I love the parental rights and education bill. I think it would do tremendous positive things for my community. When it comes to addressing kids by their pronouns, you're seeing a big push of this happen. The reason this law, which I'm going to say that I support if they do implement this, is, is they are affirming these genders, they are affirming these pronouns outside of what their parents are calling them. And so now you don't even have the parents included in this conversation and teachers are doing this behind their back. And so you have, you know, Ron DeSantis coming in and saying, you know, what no you shouldn't be doing this you shouldn't be guiding you should not be grooming these children you you should be referring to them as they were born because no child the reason gays against groomers says no child is born in the wrong body isn't to disavow that gender dysphoria exists it's to 
put force light on that children do not have the mental capacity to make these decisions fully formed and educated decisions. So that is why no child is born in the wrong body. And you can never, con well, I shouldn't say you can never, but where it stands right now, it's very likely that you would not be able to convince me otherwise because children are too innocent. And the reason why that they are going down this journey is because of the outside influences. And we're seeing these ramifications, like with that article with children dying. I think that article said 6,000, 7,500. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it's, it's a shame. And you know who that falls on if we want to blame someone for that that's going to be on the teachers because the teachers are affirming these things all across our country without their parents knowing and they're not even getting the the guided assistance that they need they're just going to school saying hey mr lopez can you call me a she instead of a he and then mr lopez is like sure mm -hmm. and it's like that is so toxic and, and dangerous and confusing yes. you've got the if kids I living two separate lives. i mean talk about confusion and a kid a child's mind one thing one whole life at home as you know jimmy Goes to school all day, gets acknowledged as whatever. Now they, they're thinking of their parents as the enemy. They're confused. They don't know who to trust. I mean, that is a mess. Mess. Did you see the, what is it, Cabo Baba rave? Did you see the Cabo Baba rave? No. The drag queen rave for little children perform for the kids? Mm -hmm. uh, you haven't seen this? Do you have it's, that, Rob? I've seen so many of these things. I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> I, it's it's horrible. Many. I'm, I'm sorry. Wanna, I want to wrap up with this for, for if you haven't already had enough of these videos, folks. This, this right here. Let me make it a little bit bigger. Yes, uh, I've forgive seen this me. One. Make the video wider. There you go. So if you if you want to if you want to play this, this is disturbing to say the least. These are yeah, kids. Parents disgusting. took them to this. The, the audio is uh, taken out on Twitter. Don't worry about it. Let it keep playing. You know what's also disgusting? Kids are sitting this, there, yeah, by the way. He thinks that this is okay. The person doing these moves think. Look at this. Like uh, it's disgusting. I don't care if he thinks it's okay. The parents think this is okay. Let him think yeah. this is okay. I'm okay with that. I don't have a problem if he thinks it's okay. Those parents who have their kids in there, tell me what the kid is learning. Like, what form of entertainment is this? It's not entertaining to me at all. This is like what adult adults used to go in a bachelorette party, grown mm -hmm. adults, and see this stuff. And now you have small children. Well, because again, you have to like you, you have to this. you have to not. It's not about normalizing the behavior. <laughs> Like these are grown adults can do whatever they want. Grown adults can also go and spend money to go see whatever they want. Right. It's about normalizing exposure of these things to small children. And it's it's deeply sick. But what is wrong with that generation? Like what is the age bracket of parents that have lost their minds here? Is it I think it's like parents in their what, 20s, 30s and maybe even early 40s that are doing this stuff because I can't think of anyone above that age bracket that I know of that thinks this is sane, but I do know some people in places like New York City who are in their 30s or whatever, that, were, oh, yeah, this is just what's happening in the world and would take their kids to stuff like this. So I don't know, man. Something's deeply sick going on. Tom, what, what does somebody have to pay you for you to take your kids to that entertainment to see something like that? How much money? There, there's no amount of money you yeah. can give me. Same here. What, what is the outcome of something like that? You know, like... Confusion. Confusion in the mind of those kids, you know, um, because... You see something like this, there, you know, it's like a sentence. There's got to be a subject, a predicate, <laughs> and, you know, a dot at the end of the sentence. And so what are, what are you telling the kids when they're going in to see this? What are they seeing? What are they interpreting? What do they think it's all about? And who's who's talking with them later? You know, which what's really interesting is you take third graders, second graders, into a school play. And the school play is about the Revolutionary War. And then what do we do? We go back to the classroom. We talk about the play we saw and we debrief a little bit. It's called learning, right? Something at the front of the class, then reflective discussions, mm -hmm. and then write something, take a test, all those things. You don't understand. You're, they're just walking out with confusion, PBD. Confusion. You know what I mean? There's no debriefing. How many of your kids, they see something at school, they see a film on Ben Franklin, they come home with a book on Ben Franklin, they debrief on Ben Franklin, and then they sit down and they write a little piece of homework. So there's this full circle coming around. When kids go in to watch that, what did you tell them you were going to watch? What did they think when they saw it? And what did you debrief afterwards? You, you, there's, I would. I, I, I want to finish with this. I want to, and I appreciate that time. I want to finish with this, Frank, from you, from Jed, from Tom. So somebody's watching this, and they're saying, this is freaking ridiculous. I got two kids, let's just say, four-year-old and an eight-year-old, okay? I got three kids, a nine, a 12, and a 15-year-old. But I only make $73,000 a year. I can't afford to put my kids in private school, and I can't afford to stay home because my job doesn't allow me to work from home. I have to go to my work. I don't have a lot of choices. 
And I, I'm starting my part-time real estate gig to try to make some money so I can put my kids in private school. But I don't have any say. When I go to my school, I'm in such a liberal left community that there's nothing. I feel like there's nothing I can do. There's 20 of us parents that we all know each other because we go to the same church. What can I do? What do you say to those parents, Jed? Honestly, what do I say? Yeah. Move. That's what I say. I know it's hard. I, I know and I, I, I understand. I grew up with very little money. Um, my parents didn't have a lot of money. They had to work very, very, very hard to get everything that they have in life. And they made decisions based on, sometimes you just have to go. If you are in a very liberal place and the school districts are terrible, you got to figure out a way to, to get out. If you can't do the private school and you can't do the homeschooling, some families, you know, are able to make sacrifices and say the dad goes to work and there's a stay at home mom. And she says, I'm going to take this responsibility on. Not everybody can do that. Some people are in situations where they need two incomes coming in. I understand it all. I also understand that moving is not easy, that there is, you know, you have families where you are, you have your home, you have there's a lot. But but this is not going this is not going to get any better in these blue cities, these blue states. It's it's moving in this direction of these videos that we've seen today and worse. So you have to make a decision at some point of what matters. And ultimately, if you are stressed every single day that you send your kids into a hmm. school and you're coming home with imagine. a different kid, you've got to consider picking up and going to a state where there's at least some parental right protections where you know you yeah. have a say in your kid's life when they're not in your home. Frank. Yeah, I would um, argue and I would just advise them to, if you can move, do so. Um, and then you also just have to play an active role in what your child is learning. I, I'm a, a huge proponent that you should ask your children and be involved in the things that they're learning so you can course correct these actions. And the earlier that you can course correct it, it's very important. Um, when it comes to you know what happens in your hometown, um, Gays Against Groomers is expanding so quickly. We get so many applications for volunteers. Go to our website and see if we have a chapter there. We will deploy someone over there to advocate for you and shield you from these things like we do all across our country. Um, and just definitely just play that active role and make sure that they're okay. Great feedback. Tom. And, and the answer is once you have kids, you have to decide what you're going to do with any spare minute of time. Is it your hobbies? Is it your desires? Or are you going to invest in this uh, in this wonderful child that you've been trusted with? And being as close to them as you can so that you can guide with frameworks is point one. Point two is, I won't repeat it, it's everything Jed just said. But I think point one is just making an avowed commitment every spare minute <laughs> I, you know, I don't have hobbies. It's one of the things my kids have noticed. When we were living in Dallas, they said, you know, Dad, you, you don't go with your friends to the OU football game. That's not a bad thing. But I knew a lot of guys who got these big RVs that would go up and be gone for the weekend for the OU football game. Now, remember, there was only, what, five, six home games for OU. It wasn't happening every week. But they noticed that my time was with them, mm -hmm. not Dodie. Tom, what a thing you just said. So everybody hit a different point. Yours was move if you can because the fear of going to school and every day you're like, my kid's going to change when they come home. That's a real sincere fear that people have. Yours is get active, be involved. Yours is drop some of the happies that are hobbies that are not necessary. You have to go to this. You have to go to that. I'm going to go to this game. I'm going to drive to this. And you're missing 18 hours of being with your kids. All great feedback. I will say this to you. And this is not going to be popular. All parents love their kids. I'm convinced. Of course, some of them that go and they don't want the responsibility. The father leaves and does it. Parents that are in their kids' lives. They love their kids. But let's face it, parents, you ain't going to like when I'm telling you this. Just kind of receive it. Sometimes you're a little lazy to want to do your job as a parent. It's, it's an, as a leader, as, believe me, I was a sales leader, and I didn't want to do accountability calls. How many calls did you make this week? Ah, forget about it. I was a lazy <laughs> leader in my 20s. Then I realized accountability is necessary to develop better leaders, parents. How was your day today? What did you talk about? What did they bring up? What did you watch? Who did you befriend? Did you have any tea? Did you think do this? Do, play them stuff for them to kind of give you feedback and realize you got to keep an eye out for this. You got to choose this. What about this? Talk to the teachers. Email teachers. Trust me, I, if I were to get a leader's bulletin of how many times parents email teachers to say what happened here, the more teachers know that the parent is involved, just like that abuser said earlier, the more involved the father is, the less I do my thing. The more involved you are, the less the teacher knows 
that they can't mess with that family. They got to know that this stuff is important to you. So I think some of it is also on, on parents not being lazy to be involved because your life is so busy with a show you're watching, with a Netflix, with a sports team you're loyal to, et cetera, et cetera. There's nothing more valuable for you to be loyal to than the future of your kids that you brought onto this world. Okay, you're going to need God's help. You're going to need community's help. But most importantly, outside of those two, you also need to lead them properly by being involved. Phenomenal podcast. I enjoyed it. Thank you for coming out. This was great. Thank you. Uh, It's a very different angle we took on the topic today. Uh, I hope you guys keep doing what you're doing. Rob, if we can put that below Gaze Against Groomers, uh, uh, what you said was important, that if you guys want somebody to come to your community and speak and lobby, go to our website, let us know. We will send somebody to your area. Put the link in the description. Put it in the chat so people can go find out about it. As well as, I think you're active on Twitter, right? If you can put his handle as well on Twitter. He's very active on Twitter. Uh, Frank, thank you for uh, being courageous, being brave, and doing what you're doing. It's not an easy job. Uh, I'm sure it's tough. Uh, You guys get uh, uh, targeted all the time. But someone's got to do it, and you've chosen to do this. And I appreciate you for doing that. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Jed, thank you for being on as well. BizDoc, thank you as well. Rob, thanks for rocking. Gang, have a great day. I think we're doing it again on Thursday. Do we have another podcast Thursday? We do. We have another one as well, our live podcast that we're doing April 6th. If you didn't purchase a ticket and you want to be at the live podcast at the new studio with the Cigar Lounge and everything, new announcement, nobody knows. Uh, Text the word podcast to 310-340-1132. Once again, 310-340-1132. Text the word podcast. You'll be the first to know who will be on that podcast. It's a controversial figure, but you're going to want to hear him, and you're going to want to hear what he has to say. It's going to be fun. It's going to be interesting. Text the word podcast. We'll let you know who it is on April 6th, Thursday in South Florida. In the evening, so it's easy to travel yes. and get here. 7 to 9 p.m., and it's the weekend of UFC. Free to go watch a UFC in Miami as well because I'll be there myself too. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye, bye-bye, bye-bye.